What makes us human is our capacity to be mortal and to be informed by our mortality. It is a monstrosity that's unprecedented to entertain the real possibility that humanity and immortality can coexist in the same being. And we haven't even got humanity figured out well. And we're already now flirting with the possibility of outgrowing the limitations of being human? Does it just make you shake your head? Or make you stand up in front of people in foreign countries and make other allegations, which is what's happening in my case. And you come to, you know, a silent stage, nobody knows what you're going to do, and you barely do yourself. And from that very unpromising beginning, you start carving in the air. My name is Matthias Olsson, and I'm the host of the Campfire podcast. I'm in Portsmouth, on the southern coast of the United Kingdom, and I've just attended a night of grief and mystery, which is a sort of a combination of storytelling and concert, with Stephen Jenkinson and his band led by Gregory Hoskins. Stephen is a poet, a spiritual activist, a sheep farmer, and a former palliative care worker. He's also the author of several books, including Die Wise, a book that I read recently and that deeply challenged any ideas I might have had surrounding death and dying. It's the day after the show, and I'm about to go meet Stephen. But before we get to the interview, here's a word from our sponsor. The Campfire podcast is an offspring from the film platform Campfire Stories. If you're interested in documentaries searching for a way towards human sanity and ecological balance, towards a world we can be proud to hand over to our children, check out Campfire Stories at campfire-stories.org or just do a web search for Campfire Stories. All right, back to the show. So I'm in Portsmouth. I've been um, taken to the address where Stephen and his band are staying uh, by my very kind Airbnb host, John. Hello, John, if you're listening. So I'm, I'm standing at the door. My heart is pounding. I ring the doorbell and the door is opened by Adam, who is the drummer in the band. Thank you. He shows me inside and takes me to meet the rest of the band and Stephen, who are all having breakfast. And when they've finished their poached eggs, uh, Emma, who is the host for, for the, or whose house it is, takes us to a house in the back where I set up my, my microphones and my stands and everything, all the gear that I've brought, while Stephen is sitting opposite of me uh, on a couch. Um, he is patiently waiting for me to get all the gear ready and he's playing the guitar. You ready? Yeah. Good. Yeah. How long a trip was it from uh, where? Stockholm? Or? Stockholm, yeah. yeah. So it was a day and a half, basically. Yeah, yeah. So it took a little while. Uh, it's a beautiful thing about train travel. It's like, um, it's like radio as opposed to television. Yeah. You, you can feel the journey. You're not skimming across the top of it. Right. Yeah, I, I, I favor it myself. I, I don't get to do it very often mm. but because the Atlantic gets in the way. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so welcome to the first ever episode, uh, podcast episode of Campfire Stories. Um, I'm sitting here with um, a man who is uh, a deep inspiration for me. I'm, I'm very grateful to have this moment. Um, he is an, an author a poet, a spiritual activist, a sheep farmer, and a former palliative care worker, Stephen Jenkinson. Did I get all the titles right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. It's good to leave a few of them out, so give me something to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I read your book, Die Wise, mm -hmm. um, and it thoroughly changed the way I see death and dying. Mm. 
and in doing so, it also changed the way I see life and living. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'd like to talk about. Okay. Um, now, you worked for many years in the palliative care uh, environment. Um, could we maybe start off by you just describing what like a regular day at work meant for wow. you? Wow, what a strange formulation, regular day, given what I did. I mean, it certainly wasn't anyone's standard of normal day. Um, I'll give you a typical and then I'll give you an extreme. Most of the days fell in between. A typical was a combination of um, ragged and, and threadbare encounters with co-workers in the form of team meetings and uh, stuff like that. And it was administrivia, as I call it. And it was... Um, It was sort of, it was deeply unsatisfying in that there was a kind of covert currency that was being exchanged uh, at the organizational level. And, it, and, it, and it's as naked as this. We're doing a good job. We can do even better. And that's what we're here to do, to improve on an unexamined assumption about what we're doing. Well, improving on an unexamined assumption is more assumptions, more unexaminedness to go with them, yeah? And I found it um, really trying in the short term and in the longer term, un- undoable, finally, for me personally. You know, so, but if you don't collude at some level, you'll never get by. You'll never get to first base. You'll never get anything done. So now you're very principled and impotent. This is not a lot to brag about, you know. So a certain amount of cunning, if you will, is mandatory to be useful. I'm not going to use the word successful, simply useful, which is a high degree of success. So so there's all of that. And there would be, uh, on any given day, probably two, minimum two appointments with dying people at their homes, usually including family members. And these things went from... Um, just walking through it as if it were a stage play where everybody already had their places determined and their scripts in place and and they were either preventing you or forbidding you from deviating from how they understood how this was supposed to go. And of course, they've never done it before. So where does this expertise and this sense of authority come from? And the answer is terror. Terror. That's That was their animating principle. And then occasionally, these people would be in deep disarray when I would come or shortly after we sat down as the, um, the kind of existential floodgates opened, you could say. Because while the families were around, generally speaking, the dying person didn't let that happen. And so they were all in cahoots, one with the other, to have as normal a life as possible under the circumstances, even though it's very clear that your normal life is the first casualty of being diagnosed. There is no normal life to resume. But of course, this is the standard um, professional advice that, that normal apparently confers its own comfort and is an indication of your well-adjustedness. It's just absolute madness. I mean, if you were drowning in the North Sea and a normal as life as possible required you to try to walk at the same time, what would you call that? <laughs> you wouldn't call it well-adapted, that's for sure. But that's what it's like. At the extreme end, m- more than occasionally, uh, I would look in the appointment book and it would say that today at two o'clock, I'm <clears throat> superintending the death of someone. Well, these are, this was in the days when uh, euthanasia in my country was um, profoundly but formally against the law. And the reason I'm making that distinction is because informally and quietly, there's no doubt in my mind that every medical institution was practicing what we came to call passive euthanasia. Mm. And that was the distinction in the law came to this. You're going to engage in comfort-giving measures, usually pain-reductive or symptom-reducing measures. These will have the unintended but anticipatable consequence of shortening a person's life. Mm. 
as long as that wasn't the purpose of administering the drugs, it was a legal enterprise. Amazing. It was all hovered around intent. Mm. Exactly the same um, activity, exactly the same results in both cases, but intent prevailed in the one case or, um, or became culpable in the other case. So I'd wake up uh, sometimes on a Monday morning and I'd look at the appointment book and at two o'clock I was to oversee someone's death. Mm. And I must tell you, there are ways to make a living where you'll never come close to the, the kind of utter finality of what you're engaged in. It was uh, very arresting at, you know, at every level and Never would I say was it distressing in the sense that you had a feeling that you were transgressing something fundamental, human, um, precious, holy, none of that ever. And, that's, and I was never hardened to these things. I have to, and I say that with some pride. Um, and it wasn't my decision to make on their behalf. It was their decision to make. And after bordering on exhaustive discussion with them about the ins and outs and the whys and the wherefores and and the understanding for their children as their children aged about all of this stuff. Mm. Uh, of course, the symptoms were intractable and were increasing and often it was around breath. So when people's breathing is, is compromised, there's a lot of terror. Mm. And um, anyway, so you wake up and you're getting dressed in the morning knowing that you know, in the afternoon, you'll be part of a small team in a quiet suburban house somewhere mm. with nobody know what's going on, and the patient in question will not live to see sundown. You know? mm. So somewhere between those two extremes, that was my mm. working life. Mm. Mm, thank you. Mm. Um, do you have any stories um, that you could tell of where you've witnessed somebody dying badly and and somebody dying well in your estimation I didn't see that many cases of people dying well and uh, when I say that my uh, my adversaries say well of course it shows in the way you talk because you have a distinctly jauntist eye about everything and if you'd only seen the success stories the ones we all know are out there well you'd have a much more balanced take on things and you'd be much more forgiving on the hope front and you know all that other stuff but think about it for a second I was working in the death trade I was not working on the medical side so I was not treating symptoms with drugs and prescriptions my obligation was to engage the dying person in the whole person reality, which is dying, not on the segregated medical front. So in that sense, I found myself to be lucky, blessed even, with having a range of ways to come to dying people, whereas medical practitioners tended not to have that. It was quite a narrow focus by comparison, and the patient's expectations were similarly narrow of them and fairly unforgiving, if we could be honest about it. So... So what's my principal responsibility when I'm working with people who are dying? Answer is to see to it that I'm no longer necessary or even particularly useful. My job was to make myself obsolete, not necessary, obsolete. And if I failed to do that, they needed me to the bitter end and beyond. Now I'm here to tell you an awful lot of people working in that business covertly seeing to it that they would be there at the end. That they would be seen by the family and by the patient to be a mandatory part of the kind of, I don't know, compassionate furniture, let's call it. And I find that disgraceful, to be honest, because I think the principal responsibility for anyone who has any, let's say, death capacity is to democratize the wisdom around these matters democratize the understanding, decentralize it, uh, see to it that you, that you dismantle the notion that this is a, an area of specialization and that it should be a specialized activity. These are ghettos. And when you, when you have specialization, you have, you know, 
a terrible disintegration of the community's capacity to be a community because now you're entrusting fundamental human function with specialized technical knowledge. Mm. And you've confused these two things. You're undoing the community's capacity to be a community. So every bad death I saw basically compromised the village's capacity to village. That's how I would say it. It undermined the village-mindedness <clears throat> that is the proper, I think, birthright of every born person and replaced it with a, an, an almost crazy-making reliance on people who'd done this before and to a certain degree were a little bit desensitized to its comings, you know, extreme comings and goings. Let's put it that way. I mean, there's a lot of people who did good work. I don't, I don't mean to suggest that the entire thing was a train wreck, but I don't take back anything I said about not working yourself out of a job. That's what you were supposed to do. You were supposed to enable the family and enable the dying person to come to dying as a god. This is what I've come to understand over the years, that dying is a deity. And in much like in the same way matrimony is a deity. How do you mean that? Well, you have your ideas about it before you go into it. But anybody who's gone into it realizes the first casualty of entering the, the arena is all your notions of what it was going to be, what it was going to ask of you, how you might do it, your, the belief system you brought to it. All of these things are properly early and more or less permanent casualties in both cases, matrimony and thanatology. And I think it's entirely proper that, that your presumptions that you crafted minus any experience of the thing should be more or less gently or forcibly relieved, that you're relieved of them, excuse me, and um, such that you can begin to ponder what this asks of you instead of what can you get out of it. Yeah? That, and there's an etiquette that comes with understanding these things in a deified fashion. A, a fundamental, profound kind of wisdom etiquette, you could call it. Partly practice wisdom, of the technical kind that helps you, um, guides you in your decision making about treatment options and all these kinds of things. And more, let's say less formally, an understanding of life that doesn't come to dying as the opposite of life. No more than God is opposite of what? Human. This is not an oppositional relationship we have. You know, and uh, in our best moments, it's collegial, bordering on kinship relation, which is, of course, an old animist understanding of, of what, quote, God in the world means. Well, anyway, all of this is to say then that I didn't see many good deaths because they didn't need me. I'm not taking credit for that. Uh, sometimes I could take credit for it. But more often than not, if I worked myself out of a job, nobody noticed I simply didn't get called, you know. And I didn't follow up every week and say, what about me, you know, <laughs> or anything of the kind. And, um, and sometimes you found out later what happened. Mm. So then your job security, and excuse me, not security, but satisfaction, is kind of the old indicators of it have to be challenged in you. So rather than wanting people to look at you in between the eyes and thank you deeply from their deathbed kind of thing, mm you would have to satisfy yourself with an understanding deeply achieved, really pursued, that you worked with them in such a way that they forgot about you as a person, as a discrete person, but that you left something behind that was more useful to them than you could have been had you lingered or insinuated yourself into the thing. I didn't see a lot of good deaths. All the bad deaths I saw were insular, inward-turned, self-absorbed, um, deeply personalized, viewed as a personal possession to do with as they saw fit. These are all recipes for a kind of wretched, impoverished understanding of, of how 
dying is not the annihilation of your humanity, but, but its final flower, really. Can you maybe give an example of a, a bad death that you witnessed? Yeah, it's not going to seem very bad. I mean, I wrote it uh, briefly in, uh, in Die Wise. There was a, a minister, a United, I think United Church minister, and he, he was dying of um, lung cancer or emphysema, one of the two. And I had been told that he's doing pretty well. And I got there and I could, I could hear the respirator. Mm. Now, by the time you're on a respirator, pretty well is a, is a strange term to use. And then uh, I was talking to his wife on the way to see him and she mentioned that he was still working, which I found, based on the information I had about the stage of the disease that he was at, the notion that he was still working was sadly not that shocking. As if this is what you're supposed to be doing at this point in your life, because now you can hear the old routine him I mean here's the job description of dying people that you're not dying while you are as mad as that sounds so I came into his room and uh, he's gray from lack of oxygen right and he's speaking very in a clipped way because he doesn't have enough oxygen to make a, a, a quote a normal sentence and um, so I, I asked him about uh, you're still working And I was hoping against hope that it, that it was the odd telephone call just to feel that he was still, quote, engaged in the greater world, you see. And no, he's, he's preaching every week. And I, I mean, he can't talk to me. So I'm, I'm picturing and then I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is sanity of a kind because maybe he's up there and he's manifesting his dying in front of them. And wouldn't this be something? Bordering on the miraculous, that he's talking about it, that it's become why he's there now. So I asked. He never mentions it. No noise it. And then he justifies his decision not to talk about his dying while he's dying in front of them from the pulpit, because people come to church on Sunday, you know, basically for respite and for, you know solutions to their little lives and to have the preacher dying in front of them visibly from one week to the next as he said too much that's the way he described it too mm. much so he had decided on their behalf to spare them the kind of strange undignified spectacle mm. of the guy they'd relied upon for some kind of spiritual guidance now imagining that the best spiritual guidance available that he could offer or manifest was to hide from them what was happening in plain view. In other words, everybody knew, but everybody knew what the etiquette was. Shh. What? Okay. So, so then, you know, I've basically I'm confounded again. I mean, here we go again, you know. And this guy's been, he's been in on people's hard lives. He's not a strange, it's not like he was a chartered accountant all his life and suddenly he's, this is, you know, So then I said to him, uh, I, I, I had one chance to say anything that would challenge this. And people listening might say, who, who are you to challenge it? And the answer is, well, first of all, I'd had a lot of experience by then, number one. Number two, I didn't get to that job um, because I was somebody's son or something. I did earn my way there, and I have no problem saying that. I was pretty good at it, too. But much more importantly, what was I doing there and who was I? First of all, there was nobody else. Second of all, I owed this man something. But he was never going to ask it from me. So that becomes an enormous kind of existential tightrope that you have to walk. You have to determine what your principal allegiance is to. And then you have to find the kind of strategy of delicacy and artistry and precision a kind of a samurai-like willingness to draw the the bow uh, string back for a hundred years and release it in half a second that's really what it was because if you're going to take these things on basically you have one chance to do it and your timing has to be impeccable frankly so this is a matter of great discernment rather than barging into people's lives with your quote agenda which is what I was accused of all the time. 
So I derived my understanding of what I was there to do, not from my personal belief system, but from what was not happening in the place I was being asked to go to, you see? So after a while, this became instinctual. So I had one chance with this man. And I asked him, um, this man that you've been preaching about all your life, all your working life, when it was his turn, did he tell anybody? And he just blanked. I mean, he, he knew who I was talking about. Mm. But for some reason, he didn't make, he couldn't bridge. Well, what do you mean for some reason? Of course he couldn't bridge it. Because if he did, he wouldn't be able to stand up in front of the pulpit every week and not talk about his own death, mm. I don't think. But he never made the bridge, and so it was easy to keep them separate. Mm. The example that was set by the guys preaching about and his own example never met. And this is, this is the chance I took. This man you've been preaching about, yeah? When it was his turn, and he saw his own death coming down the road towards him, because that's what the story says. Did he tell anybody? Do you remember? And he drew a blank, and I said, well, he did, in fact. I mean, I'm not making this up. It's called The Last Supper. You can read it for yourself. <laughs> I mean, I don't say that to him. I say that to people listening. Read it. Don't listen to me. Just read it for yourself. Because he literally says two things, both of which indicate that he's going to be dead soon. One of them is, you know, drink this. This is my blood. Well, you don't drink somebody's blood who's still alive in a horror movie, maybe. <laughs> but generally speaking, or unless you're maybe an Aztec in the old days. But otherwise, we know what we're saying here. There's blood to drink, so he won't need it anymore. And eat this, this is my flesh kind of thing. So, what, so the, literally what he's telling them is this. I'm telling you I'm going to be dead soon. And it is this news that will nourish you now. It won't be anything else that you'll get from me because there's nothing else coming. So the last thing I have to give you is the way I die. And if the gods are with us, or he might have said God, if God is with us, <laughs> then everything I've tried to say and to be with you will be present now without being articulated verbally, just by the example. And I believe fairly surely that that moment in what they call the passion in that Gethsemane when he's praying on his own because he knows what's going to happen in the morning, and he asks people to stay awake with him because he's, he's in... The terror. He's in the terror. And he's asking for help. And he's asking for a way out. And he does. And finally, somewhere in there, his willingness finds his fate, you could say. And he brings that understanding to his friends. And he makes it an act of ultimate friendship to include them in his death. In so doing... He's asking them to see his death as the legitimate outcome of what they were trying to do together. So you're going to have to proceed without me now, which is utterly fitting. Because I was never at the center of this thing. I know he doesn't say that in the historical record, but my strong guess is somewhere in there, even as a young man, because he was just young, right, in the early 30s, mm. somewhere in there he must have had an understanding if the whole thing revolves around him, um, the whole thing is not worth it. And the world doesn't need another religiosity that hovers around a, a personality type, you know. And so he was willing, it seems to me, to understand his death as, as the proper incarnation of what he had in mind. Minus the martyr thing. And, uh, well, this is a, obviously, I didn't go into it in this much detail with this guy who can hardly breathe in front of me. But I did ask him to consider the distinct possibility that the news he gave was the real communion. It was symbolized in the blood or in the wine and the, in the wafer and the blood and the flesh. But it was the news. Look, I'm dying. This is what you have to eat now. This will be more nourishing to you than you could ever imagine possible if you eat it, though. But if you take it on faith and you don't take it in, which, excuse, the, excuse me for saying this, but that's the Christian church in a nutshell. You don't take in the, the, the carnal reality of his demise. 
<clears throat> because you turn it into a victory story where he didn't, he, he sort of died, but he didn't really die. He didn't completely and utterly die. Okay, he utterly died, but then the next second he didn't. And, mm. you know, the whole thing is a victory over the, you know, the, the victory that neither you nor I will be in on. Mm. So, so I, I, I just asked him to consider that, and I was never invited back. <laughs> See? So you say, that's your example of a bad death? I mean, where's all the bodily fluids flying around the room? Where's the screaming in the middle of the night? Where's, well, the whole thing's medicated, isn't it? What do you mean medicated? His, well, it was medicated by his belief system. The whole thing is tranquilized by his certainties. And I can tell you, I saw a lot of people come in their dying time with unexamined certainties about these matters. And as they came closer and closer, those certainties began to slip. And I don't say this with any joy, but I can tell you that any belief system about dying that is not derived from the realities of dying is a belief system waiting to crumble when those realities come to call. Because they're prejudices masquerading as belief systems, you see. They're not informed by the realities. They're taken as an insurance against the realities. So how do you think it's going to work out? Because the realities win every time. So it's a muted bad death, isn't it? It's not a spectacular bad death because the spectacular ones are easy to recognize as bad. But the, the vast majority were some iteration of what I just told you, that the beliefs were never seriously challenged, that people resorted to you know, very, very intense medication that was beyond controlling their physical symptoms, ultimately sedated for, for a kind of existential terror that was never discussed, never identified, never diagnosed, never suspected. Yeah. Every good death by comparison that I saw was outward turned, hmm. engaged in the world in some fashion that the dying person and the family understood their death to be the occasion for the greater family and for the community to find its capacity for humanity again. And rather than being a personal possession, it actually belonged to everyone that the person knew and neighbors who didn't really know them and people down the street or in the shops that would see them very occasionally. And as the news went out, this person's dying and you won't see them again. All the consequences begin to you know, subtly inform people's days. And they would probably look at their routine behaviors, even for a little while, a little differently, because there's something in their routine that has disappeared, even though the person is technically still alive. These, these consequences are, are properly subtle, but, but they emanate. They really have a, a staying power for a while. And you wonder about sleepwalking through your life simply because somebody doesn't get to sleepwalk anymore. But if you, if you hold on to it, you hold on to the information and you don't let anybody in on it, well, our capacity to sleepwalk is completely unchallenged, isn't it? Because you can challenge it at some level with just basic kind of religious or, or philosophical teaching about awakenness or, you know, but there's nothing to replace the jarring impact of engaging the imminent goneness of a fellow human being. That shit will really address your, your crazy, habit-ridden self. Not with guaranteed outcome, but there's something in there that extends to you the possibility of a kind of radical self-examination that you'd never undertake on your own if your habits are still intact. And that's what a good death is. It's the community's opportunity to go, whoa, let's start again, bearing this in mind. Hmm. You know, we are river around a stone sometimes, right? This is so big. It should change everything. The enormity of this. Like what? It's not to eclipse my well, How about your take? To endorse it. On, on what you're capable of. It should change that. It's not the end of meaning. You should change what you think you are being implored. Being alive by what took place. Is for. You should change that. To have our humanity deepened by exposure to it. 
because it's the time when things get fortified, not when they get wondered about. The husband, the husband was a pilot for the national airline and he was flying in August. And I saw him in September, at the end of September, in his, what used to be his living room and was now his dining room. And that's how quickly it happened. And he went from being completely able-bodied and passing all the physicals and all the medicals and all that responsibility in the air to being cachectic in eight weeks. For those who don't know, cachectic means withered and losing so much body mass that you basically become skeletal and cadaverous, you could say. Well, almost everything that happens too. There's two parts of the body that you can see all the time that don't quite get reduced or because everything else is reduced, they're magnified. And one of them is the hand. So when dying people who are withering that way begin to gesture as they can do, their hands begin to look like kites on the end of sticks. And the other thing that looms so large suddenly is their face in the pillow. It looks like the moon in a field of white. And the eyes are enormous. And this man had all of that. And I sat down in the seat that must be mine. And there he lay in front of me. And his wife sat behind him, facing me, deeply unsure of the wisdom of this encounter. And their three-year-old son, who they had conceived together with a plan, of course, to seeing him unto his graduation and his wedding and the deepening of his days was playing quietly and unknowingly enough in the kitchen with his toys. And I looked at the man and I looked at the woman and I had to decide what my job was because I knew he didn't have a lot of energy. And this was not a time to, as they love to say in those businesses, make a relationship, form a relationship. There's no time for that. You have to be a human being instead. And so I said to him, what's your understanding of what's happening to you? And he said, I think I'm, I'm really seriously ill. And friends, seriously ill is not a synonym for dying. It's possible to be seriously ill and not die at all of that then. And of course, it's possible to be dying and almost be symptom free for the longest time. So I knew he didn't have the language for it. Though he had all that responsibility, but he didn't have that gift apparently. Or he did, but he opted not to use it. I only had one more question, that's all I had. And if this went nowhere, I was going to thank them and apologize for intruding. This is all I had. I said to him, at enormous risk to us all, I said to him, is there anything that you're not sure about that you'd like to ask now? And he waited. And that's the first time he really looked at me. And he said, after a long pause, in just this voice, he said, Am I dying? And for the briefest of seconds, I looked at his wife and her look said everything. It said, no, you don't. No, you won't. You know what the right answer to this question is. Answer it properly. And then I looked at him and I had to make a decision as someday you might have to as well. And the decision was, to whom do I owe what? And it's a ruthless moment because you have to choose. I chose, I chose him. And I looked at him and I didn't blink and neither did he. I said to him, yes, 
Yes, you're dying. Uh, I have a friend of mine who I sometimes engage in discussions with, and he's very excited at the prospect of scientists coming up with, uh, you know, this is going, I see you nodding, <laughs> pills or some sort of medication or something that will extend our lives. Um, and I feel instinctively that I'm not excited about that, but I can't really put words on it properly. Um, but I was wondering, how would you respond if somebody came to you with a, here's a hundred more years pill? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say, that's it? Just a hundred years? <laughs> if, you can get us, if you can get us to a hundred years, come on. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say, I mean, I've been asked to think about this quite a bit. And this is what I've come up with. Some years ago, I was doing a little... Uh, talk like this with a couple of younger guys who were in some studio somewhere so we never met and about half an hour into it this young guy asked a question no one of any age had ever approached the level of deep kind of soulful sophistication that's in this question and I was really wowed by it and this is what he said to me he said now he said I'm going to tell you something going to sound like science fiction to you but I promise you it's happening And he said, judging by your voice, it would probably be too late for you. <laughs> But um, it's coming. Within a generation or two at most, it'll come online. That's the phrase he used. I said, uh-huh. He said, well, they're working on a serum, you see. And if you take the serum, you won't have to die. So my question to you is, if I take the serum and I don't die, what will I miss? I mean, remarkable. The willingness to consider the possibility that by not dying you miss something, that is an act of extraordinary kind of psychic bravery, really. And I credit him then and now for that. And as is my want, I will promptly wonder about the question and its, and its assumption and see if I can do something that honors the question by coming up with a, a, a question that stands on the shoulders of the previous one. So let's first examine the language that he used. He said, if I take the serum, <coughs> I won't have to die. In this phrase, you can hear the standard understanding of what dying is. It's something that's done to you, something over which you have no control, no choice. This is not good. This confounds your sense of personal autonomy, and that's not good. And I could just go on, but we've talked about some of these things already. But most importantly, you can hear by the, by the phrasing, I won't have to die. It's the have to that is so objectionable. Now I act with the serum to finally set that injustice right. I won't have to die. So let me restate it in a way that I think is in the, in the realm of death trade orientation. How about this, though? How about you take the serum and you won't be able to die? Because metabolically, it'll, it's the same statement. But in every other level, it's not the same statement. You won't be able to die carries a different prejudice about dying. Yes, it does. What is it that dying is a skill, not an affliction? That your humanity is being entrusted to you emphatically at that time. Your humanity is being relied upon, tried and tested in some fashion, and deeply required by the culture and the world around you. But if you come to dying as a grudge match that's just ripping you off, well, none of that nobility, none of that challenge, none of that understanding of humanity appears anywhere at all. And now dying is like the opposite of your humanity instead. So I'm, I'm trying to recast the thing so that the God of finality is in the room 
and the etiquette is inferred thereby, so you won't be able to die. Maybe the question then becomes, by virtue of your inability to die, what will the rest of us miss? That's what I said to him. And you could hear me turning the focus away from personal benefit mm. to cultural consequence. Because the rest of us will lose something if you don't die in our midst. So a lot of time went by. Uh, some guy wrote a book, I've forgotten his name now, a uh, big bestseller, like 30 languages. Something about, I think it's called uh, Sapien. And um, a lot of people know about it. Brief History of Humanity, all that. And then he wrote a sequel, uh, something in the, in the order of uh, the near future. Uh, what's coming in the near future? The, t the title escapes me right now. But, and <clears throat> I'm listening to him interviewed on the radio, and it goes like this. Guy says, now they're working on a serum. He says, it's going to sound like science fiction to you. And I'm, <laughs> I mean, it's verbatim. And I already know which, what he's talking about. He said, they're working on a serum. It's going to sound like science fiction. He said, it's coming online within a generation or two. Probably too late for you, he said. <laughs> but for the younger people around, it will be part of their world. And the fellow says, yeah, what, what's that? He said, well, you take the serum, you won't have to die. The exact same formulation. Same prejudice, same investment in the grudge match against endings, you see? So the interviewer says, well, he says, what do you think the consequences will be of this near future development? And the man says, well, he said, um, we're going to have to find a new word for those people who take the serum because human won't describe that anymore. So he would say, I would say that we will, at that point we would be divine. That's the word he used, divine. So just think about it for a second. Rather than just react cynically to the word divine, you could ask yourself, what, what makes something someone divine, though? And it's pretty inescapable that in our understanding of divine is included the basic condition of non-suffering, non-limitation, no need of any reciprocal arrangement with any other life form, exquisite self-sufficiency, and of course, no endings. No mortality, no death for the divine. So how do you come by divinity? And the answer is by a lack of mortality. How then do you come by humanity? Mortality. That's why he needed a new word. Though he didn't make all the connective leaps that I just did, but it was in what he was saying. What makes us human is our capacity to be mortal and to be informed by our mortality. It is a monstrosity that's unprecedented to entertain the real possibility that humanity and immortality can coexist in the same being. Humanity is a casualty of immortality. And we haven't even got humanity figured out well. And we're already now flirting with the possibility of outgrowing the limitations of being human. Let's just make you shake your head. Or make you stand up in front of people in foreign countries and make other allegations, which is what's happening in my case. <laughs> so I'm with you. I'm far from being excited. I am mobilized, though, on these matters. And I would point out, you know, as a last part to the answer of the question, if you take note of where the big dot-com money is going, like the big Amazon millions, right, the Tesla millions, all these guys, you know, it's going in two directions, Right how to get to Mars when everything goes sideways and the water's too high. And immortality. No accident that these things are joined at the hip. But my little question is, what generation is seeking mortality? Immortality, excuse me. Is it people in their 60s and 70s and beyond? Nope. The big dot-com money is not in that generation. It's in the people in their 30s and 40s. Whoever imagined a time that with limitless financial possibility, people in the early middle age of their life would already be concerned about outfoxing and outsmarting mortality 
and pouring their considerable resources into pulling that off. This has become an existential dread of people in their early middle age, already not people in their advanced age. That's amazing to think that thought. This is what's happened in the space of my lifetime. And one of the reasons is, as our life is being extended into the 80s and into the 90s and even beyond, the age at which we began to age is not getting older in a concomitant fashion. The time at which we begin to age is actually getting younger as we grow older. How does that work? Well, first of all, if they're extending your age and your lifespan, which they will do for you, even if genetics are not in your favor, ask yourself, where's this life extension, where does it visit you? Do you get more youthful years? Do you get more childhood as a result of an extended lifespan? No. It's all tacked on the end. All of it. That means you'll be older longer than you'll be anything else. See? That's one. Two. It used to be that one of the signs of age was that the culture had less and less need of you. In the workplace, in the most obvious way in the workplace, but in other places as well. You became slightly less physically adroit, and you know, you understand what I mean. And this, is, this marked the point at which you could begin to understand yourself as aging. Well, I know people who are in their late 30s, working in the IT sector in particular, who know themselves to be virtually obsolete before they're 40 years old. Why? Because people who are 19 years old are hipper and quicker mm. with the new technology than they are even with all their experience, their time in. They started working in IT before this kid was even born. Mm. And 20 years later, this kid is taking their job. Okay, mm. So they're becoming obsolete in their workplace a full 15 to 20 years younger than the prior generation did. And that's what I mean, that you're aging sooner. And all the information is whispering to you that you, your agedness has begun now, even though your sense of physical capacity is basically unchanged and unchallenged from when you were 25 or so. Mm. But that turns out not to be the, the real reliable indicator. It's the culture whispering to you about your viability. Isn't that something? I'd like to move on to something that is outside of your area of expertise. I hope that's all right. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, well, let's see. <laughs> all right. Probably I, it is. I think so. Sure. Um, so uh, I've read uh, Plato lately and, and the story of Socrates and how he died and how he was sentenced to death, and how he gathered his uh, friends uh, the, the nights before, and so on. And his friends were all crying and, and bewildered, uh, but he was very calm about it. This, uh, this is how the stories go, I don't know. This was 2,000 years ago or something, mm -hmm. so I don't know. But um, he, seemed to, he seemed to have died well, uh, I would say. Um, and he spoke of... Opposites. He said that, that, that nothing can exist without the existence of its opposite. So we cannot have tall people unless there is also short people. And we cannot have beauty unless there's also ugliness. And of course, the, life cannot exist without death. And he also said that um, from the moment we are born, we are headed towards our death. So it stands to reason that from the moment we die, we somehow must be headed towards life or rebirth, possibly. Um, so how do you see the afterlife? Or how, do you, I guess you must have wondered about it, uh, as we all have. Uh, do you have any feelings about it or, or, or clear visions of it? Or? Uh, well, let's start with the word afterlife. There's no such thing. Well, you say that with real authority. Where did you get that from? Just the word. Okay, take the word life. 
What does that refer to? Everything. Right. Everything's life. Yeah? Yeah. Well, how can you have something called after everything? Because doesn't everything include the after thing too? Doesn't it? Seems to me that it does. So the real trap here is not afterlife. That's a very limited understanding. The real trap is the characterizations you made earlier that you attribute to Plato, and I think probably accurately. It's binary and it's oppositional. That's the word you used, opposite. And that's the trap. The notion... Okay, here's an example. I'm looking at a guitar between us here, and the top of the guitar is pine-colored. What is the opposite of that yellow? Well, you look at properly, you look at me in kind of vague confusion, like how could there be an opposite to yellow? Exactly. There is no opposite to yellow. What's the opposite of a chair? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What's the opposite of a floor? Right. What's the opposite of wood on the floor? Okay. Virtually nothing obeys this oppositionality. Mm. Nothing is obliged to take an opposing position in order for the first thing to be substantiated and have its own presence and consequence. Mm. Okay? It's a very atrophied understanding of life. Right? We don't, the, the opposite is not required. The rest is what's required. The rest of the story. Here's the part you're talking about, and there's the rest of it. So you hear again, this kind of village-informed notion that the meaning of your life... Okay, there's a lot of old hippies now who are insisting on being at their own wakes. I hear about this a lot lately. And first of all, I'm not surprised because the baby boomers have always had it their way, and so you wouldn't be shocked that they even want to be at their own wake. But here's the, you have to tell them, don't you understand that the word wake signals that something happened that made the wake necessary or advisable and what was that you died you died you can come to somebody else's wake no matter how sick you are no problem but you can't come to your own wake because you're not dead yet right so the sense of personal privilege that informs this lunatic idea look just call it a party that now you can come but it can't be awake your wake if you're there unless you're they got you up in the corner you know, with a couple of two-by-fours up behind you to hold you upright, that'd be okay. But you don't get to be there, right? So the wake is not the opposite of your life. It's the rest of your life. And that's where the meaning of your life begins to cohere. As people tell stories, you know, and some of them are lies. Some of them are, nobody was there at the time, but they're talking with authority and da 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 Some of them are slanderous things, of course. Somewhere in there, the, begin, the meaning of your life begins to become articulate and start to mobilize and to move. And people begin to conceive of you as a thing entire, you could say. Not quite finished, but the information is done now. And the meaning of the thing is in the offing now. And how we live with your goneness is the last part of the story that you, as the dead person, do not get to inform us about. That's our job as village-minded people. The meaning of your life is entrusted to us, not to you. That's not the opposite of you. That's the rest of you. So what's the rest of yellow? <laughs> the spectrum, right? And what's the rest of wood? Everything else uh, where that tree came from and everything that relies upon it, which ultimately would be us as well. And, and so on down the line. So what's the rest of life? Well, life doesn't have an opposite with the possible exception of non-being. You know, from what I've been able to gather in my travels over the years, and this is a gross generalization, but you might say that non-missionized indigenous people have an understanding of hell that's not informed in any way by a Bible story. Their understanding of hell seems to be non-being. The possibility 
that you had never been. The possibility that you will now not be. Now that you're dead. I think that's their take on hell. The utter corruption of being. Death is not. The, uh, death is part of that story. Because, as you, you know, rightly observed, if you don't have death, you don't have earth. So, unless you've got a hydroponic farm in the sky, which everybody's working on now, it's a death-free environment, isn't it? Well, the water's kind of a problem, you know. But you take the point uh, that earth comes from the demise of things. Mm. And that's what all life is planted in. Because life, no matter how many times you say the opposite, life's not life-giving. Life's life-taking. That's what it does. Life consumes as it goes. So you can't rely upon life in order to live. You have to rely upon everything that once lived that will endorse and underwrite your capacity to live now. Which, as a person who grows things one to another, mm. you understand exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. That you're really a dirt farmer, ongoingly. You're not a rye or a corn farmer or a pig farmer or a sheep farmer. You're a dirt farmer. If you have any sanity in the matter at all, you are forever augmenting everything that died before your turn at this farm. Right? And you're introducing recently dead matter to the place in hopes that some bit of life can grow thereby. But these are not opposites. These are mutually reliant things, you see. So they don't require a kind of open warfare between them to become distinct and then to, to appear before us. Mm. Right? So the, the wild... <laughs> I don't know where I was when this language appeared... But all of a sudden, people are talking about codependent, like it's the worst conceivable relationship you could ever be in. Think of what the word means. You depend on me, I depend on you. I look around, every other life form is engaged in, in life on that basis. <laughs> and then it comes to humans, at least the Western variety, who are so deeply, bizarrely concerned about maintaining their fidelity to this thing called self the self itself being a mystery bordering on an illusion. And yet the fidelity it claims fr from us is <clears throat> unhesitating. What's the opposite of a self? Everybody else? No, they all got selves too, apparently, so that's not oppositional. So, so what's the opposite? Ah, I know, those life forms that have no self. Oh, you mean like not a soul or something? No sentientness, is that it? Like, are we talking about stones here? You really wanting to go out on a limb and say nothing's alive except that which resembles us? We who depend on everything in the world to be here, such that we have a shot at it at all. The most dependent beings in the entire arrangement, as far as I can tell. We require everything, nothing requires us. There's no other life form on the planet that that describes well. So our particular wrinkle is to be remorselessly codependent upon the world and upon each other. This is the rudiments of culture. So I was obviously born in the wrong time, at least from personal satisfaction point of view. But I'll still go ahead and push a, a, just a little bit, sure. nudge and see what happens. Um, because when I think of, now I'll be careful not to use the word afterlife, but um, when I think of death and what happens possibly beyond, um, I have two varieties that I entertain. And in one of them, the one that I sort of would like for it to be, I still have, I'm still me in a, in a way on that other side. It's still, yeah, the, the, the backpack of my experiences. Sure. And in the other version, I sort of... Um, uh, Become, become part of the rest of life and the rest of everything and, and, and I dissolve to be an I uh, or me and uh, I, I, I'm just part of that which underpins life um, so would you 
yeah, I'll just leave you there. And, and do you have any other thoughts on that? Well, I don't know if being an I in the first place was the greatest achievement available to you. So the notion that you would preserve or conserve some aspect of that achievement in your death, I wouldn't wish that upon you necessarily. While you might wish it upon yourself, I don't forbid you from doing it. I'm not sure I advise you to pursue it. So there's that. Secondly, our, our principal participation in the arrangement is at the level of our capacity to sustain. Not to be sustained, but to sustain. Of course, our current funeral practices, most of them forbid that. You're not allowed actually to go back to the soil at all, or you do so in the most poisonous, wretched and toxic form. Not good for anybody. Having said that, I'm going to say something that doesn't seem consistent, probably, and it's this. I'm not persuaded that death makes us, how should I put this, absolves us of any cultural affiliation or, or identity or... It seems to me that all of those cultures that proceed in the presence of their dead do so not as if this is a generic, amoebic kind of life form in the sky with no cultural information or allegiance or anything. They seem to understand their dead as an extension of their cultural reality. Maybe that's the only kind of death there is. Is a culturally specific, cultural, culturally faithful death time. Because surely, you know, all the stories that I've heard from these people about what happens afterwards and the mutual obligation between the living and the dead that the stories are there to educate us about, all of them seem to include the understanding that you are a dead Algonquin person, not a generic plasma, you know what I mean? Mm. So I don't know if they're onto something, but some part of me longs for that to be true. I guess, that, that, that death is a cultured thing as well. And that there are no plasmic dead. There are specific, that's what the word ancestor means. Ancestor is a relational term. You're only an ancestor by virtue of the willingness of subsequent generations to claim you. That establishes your ancestorhood, if you will, Right? Well, that is very deeply culturally uh, uh, arrived at and practiced. So if I had a choice, if anybody consulted me on the matter, I would say, if you're going to make a mistake on the thing about what happens after you die, err on the side of there's some kind of cultural continuity. And so work in the present moment in this world to establish our capacity to live our end of that cultural continuity, just in case I'm right. And if it turns out to be the plasma thing, it's not a terrible mistake to have made in your life to try to ready the present generation, the living, for the capacity to live alongside their dead. It's not the worst thing you've ever done. Thank you for that. Thank you too. I chose, I chose him, and I looked at him, and I didn't blink and neither did he. I said to him, yes, yes, you're dying, and this is what it's like, and you have nothing more to wait for. There's no more auspicious sign than the ones that have already come. and." You're not at the beginning. You're deeply into it now. And it was only when I said that that I realized that the entire time we'd been talking, his shoulders were way up under his ears like this. And as soon as I said that to him, the whole thing dropped like that. And he let out a long sigh that I can only fairly describe as complete and utter relief. His wife, on the other hand, 
She was angry, she was betrayed, and she was out for vengeance, and she exploded to the point where the son in the kitchen looked up briefly to try to figure out what was wrong. And she wept and she screamed at the same time, as many of us in this room, maybe myself included, might well have done. And she said, you could be wrong. You've been wrong. You could be wrong about this. They could be the wrong test. We got somebody else's test. And she went on with all the possibilities, all the pleadings that it's, of course, it's otherwise. And he's simply ill. And she finished her tirade by saying to me, out of complete and unconsidered love, she said, anyway, she said, isn't there such thing as miracles? And that, that was the ace of spades. That was the, the card. And I don't talk about miracles very much, and most people don't either. I'll do my best to give you a few of what I said to her, scrambling as I did to try to be a worthy human, worthy of their extraordinary heartbreak, which I seem to have played a small part in delivering to their doorstep. I said to her, would you say there's such a thing as the natural order of things? It's a little neutral phrase, but could it be that there's, a, there's something called the way things go, do you think? She said, wiping herself like this, she said, I guess so, maybe, yeah, why? I said, well, I said, was it in the natural order of things, looking back on it now, that the two of you met, how and when and why that you did? You remember that. You remember when you look back on it, it didn't have a little smudge of meant to be on it, somehow. She said, yeah, it did. I said, well, that's what I mean by the natural order of things. Some kind of meant to be-ness that keeps welling up, not all the time, because some things don't seem to be meant to be, but an awful lot of them do. She said, okay. And I said, could it be that you met your husband because you could and because you were ready and because you knew what was possible suddenly and you'd made all the mistakes you were needed to make on your own and now you get to make mistakes with somebody else. Could it be? And she looked at me very suspiciously. She said, yeah. I said, and could it be? Could it be that you meeting brought you to today? That you'd never be here if you hadn't met. You'd never have the chance to be this way with any other human being if you hadn't met. Could it be? She said, I guess it could be. And I said, could it be that there's something miraculous in you having met and made a son? And she said, it is. And I said, could it be then that the miracle of life now includes this? And could it be that your dying husband who won't see 30 years of age is the miracle that you are seeking the only one so far in your life together that you've overlooked. It's not easy to say that to a fellow human being at a time like that. But it comes down to what do you owe people? Not what do they want from you? More, what do they deserve? Thank you for the gift of your evening.
This program was brought to you by the film platform Campfire Stories with films that are disconnected from the mainstream but well in tune with the zeitgeist. Check it out at campfire-stories.org. See you there.